we'll give it one more minute, just a little bit of housekeeping. Feel free to use that uh, chat function. Um, but then if you have any questions, put it in that Q&A function. We have some folks on the back end here that are going to be taking those questions, shooting them over to us so we can answer them for you. I do have to preface there. We probably can't get to all the questions. There's so many flowing through. We'll try to get to as many as we can. We're going to stop periodically throughout this to answer questions, and then we'll leave the back half to answer as many as we can. But definitely throw them in there. We'll try to get to as many as we can here. Um, and I think we can get started. These folks on here don't need much of an introduction. Um, we got Cody, we got Eric and Trent from Born and Raised. I have been fortunate enough to be on a couple hunts with these guys. Actually messed up some encounters for them while I was on those hunts, but been called out a couple of times for not shooting one with them. But we've had some great hunts together. Cody, Eric, Trent, thanks for joining. Absolutely, man. This is awesome. Thank you guys for hosting this thing. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. And these guys have a ton of information. So definitely, you know, feel free to ask any questions. Do keep an eye out. We're going to send you some resources, including this deck. And then we're going to do a giveaway. So you'll get all this stuff in the email and we'll be posting it in the comments. So keep an eye out for that after the webinar. Yeah, super excited to be here. It's crazy. We're just talking. There's 40 days of elks, 40 days till we get uh, elk season kicked off here in Oregon. And it's like, hit the stop watch right now. We need time to slow down. So yeah. everything's going quick. It'll be here before we know it. Yeah. Yes, it will. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the thing we want to talk through, like, like Zach said, you guys have any questions, hammer along. We'll, we'll try to jump through some questions here throughout the, the presentation, but also at the very end. Um, but if something sparks your uh, interest while we're talking through here, hit the Q and A. Um, the big thing we wanna talk about, like obviously if you guys have watched any of our content, we, we cover a lot of ground and try to call elk. That's our main forte. Um, we, we definitely don't glass that much when it comes to elk hunting. We use the, the calls as our tools. So. are needed uh, to go into the elk woods. We've got a, a mouth call here, um, diaphragm call. We have a bugle tube right there, and we have uh, an estrus external call. Trent's got there. Um, and so with uh, your guys' permission, we wanted to make a few sounds here, just kind of talk through some of the basics before we jump into tactics on calling elk. Trent, well, Let's swing from the fences, Cody. What do you, uh, let's just start out with a simple cow call. Let's just yeah, so um, on, on a mouth call, um, the, the thing we'll, we'll talk about, you can make a lot of different unique sounds out of it. So it's one of our number one tools. Without a mouth call, I'd feel paralyzed in the elk woods. Um, so there's a lot of calls on the market. Um, find one that works for you. When you find one, buy multiple. So you, if you lose it, break it, whatever, you got one backed up, ready to go. Um, but, but simple cow call with a mouth read. Um, we'll go through a couple sounds there and then we'll jump into the bugle. Um, on the mouth read, what you're gonna do basically, is you're gonna bring your tongue up into the latex for pressure. And as you increase the pressure, it's gonna increase, increase the pitch of that. So simple cow call, we'll start low, go to high. Very simple deal. Um, and as you, like I said, pressure, as you increase the pressure, is going to increase the pitch. All this sounds coming from your diaphragm. You're pushing air from your diaphragm. You're not trying to blow out a candle. So you're, it's like fogging glasses is how you're going to introduce that air. Um, we'll jump in on the bugle. Um, we have a few different notes here that we, but our go-to is a locate bugle. We do a two-tone, essentially. We've learned over the years that that low note really carries further in the elk woods. Um, so think of like a train horn sound. Um, seems to do really good for getting a bull to answer from a long ways away. So that there, you've got, like I said, that low note into a high note that gets that sound. And we'll, we'll use this just when we're trying to locate bulls. Um, and it carries very good. You get up on a high ridge, work that ridge down, and um, it, it travels really well. 
Next up is a lip ball. Um, this is a sound that's in a bugle. So as you're bugling, you're gonna bring your lips together, purse your lips, and you'll get a buzz with your lips. Um, so it, without a call, essentially you're gonna get a Put that into a bugle tube with a reed in your mouth. And uh, that gets that sign of that realism uh, type tone. And we'll, we'll introduce that in as into a calling sequence, calling sequence, especially we'll talk about the dance and what we do uh, get that bull fired up. Next sound real quick, jump in on the chuckle. So the chuckle is one, uh, it kind of, in my opinion, is the hardest to master and sound good about it. I still feel like I'm struggling after calling out for 30 years here, but um, what you're gonna do with the chuckle is you're gonna air exchange in and out. So when you're doing that, um, you're, a lot of times with the chuckle, instead of just blowing air out, you're going to exchange that air in and out, get that sound back and forth. Woo, 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 woo. Kind of like a gorilla, as Trevor said before, um, getting that, adding the voice into it. And it's basically an exaggerated cow call at that point with the voice inflection. <laughs> um, the big thing about chuckle getting down is the cadence and getting that air exchange in and out. Um, challenge bugle is basically taking all these notes together and putting them in one deal. So you're going to have a bugle, a lip ball, and a chuckle. That's where your aggression level um, gets cranked up. And this is what a challenge bugle sounds like. Um, and we kind of talk through, we'll, we'll go through on the emotion side. That's when things Stuff's getting serious. Bull's getting close. He's getting fighting mad. That's that challenge bugle. Uh, and last but not least is the bark scream or the bark chuckle. This is one of those tools that we've used over the years. Um, a lot of times that you get a bull that hangs up and he's 80 yards and he's, he's looking for a visual confirmation of seeing where that sound came from. He's gonna bark at you. Not necessarily an alarm bark, but it's show yourself. And when you do this back to him, bark, chuckle, bark, scream, a lot of times gives that confidence like, okay, no, he's just over there. And uh, this is what the bark scream sounds like. And the bark chuckle. So that's kind of the rundown on the bugle tube sounds. Um, Trent, Eric, you guys want to talk through on the asterisk? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Trent. Just real quick, too. Cody makes this look really, really easy. Like, he just runs through them like, oh, yeah, you just do this and you do that. Yeah. I'm still practicing to sound like Cody, so don't feel bad if it takes you a while to, well, uh, to what, master it. <laughs> what we're doing, Strand, is teaching Cody and Trevor better. That way, we're pretty much shooter every time. So. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah, don't, don't feel bad if you can't do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to talk about the old external cow call, which is one I have right here. This is our, our two-tone. Um, and the reason it's an external is the reed is outside of the call. So this reed vibrates. That's what gives you the tone you're looking for. And then you actually use your, your lips or your teeth to then control the reed and then duplicate the sounds you're looking for. So I'll kind of run through real fast. I like to use my, my lips. Um, Trent actually does his in reverse. I do mine with the read up. Um, and I think Steve, trying to correct me if I'm wrong, but Steve is same, his same way as you. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. 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 So I always run through it. Like the best way to learn on these is to start at the end. That's going to be your high pitch. And as you roll down the tone board, that's going to be your low. So I'm just going really slow right now. But if I speed it up, I can get a, a cow or a calf sound. Hopefully that's not blowing out your guys' eardrums, but is it sound? The sound kind of comes in and out, but it, it, I think they got the idea. Okay. So anyway, yeah, you want to start at the at the very end, then move forward. I like these calls for locating. I also like them in any type of like timber type scenario. Um, the sound is just super pure and uh, realistic. We also went with a uh, this is an acrylic uh, barrel, 
I'm sorry, acrylic tone board with a, a uh, aluminum barrel just to give us um, some different sounds, very realistic sounds, and also the, the density of the materials makes, makes the volume that much louder. So. Yeah, and you can find all these on Born and Raised Calco. We will link you guys to there. You're actually, if you keep an eye out, we're going to be doing a, uh, a giveaway where you'll get some gear there, but then also we're going to have a promo code for you guys to get a discount in that email that you'll receive tomorrow. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Cody, Eric, Trent, one question that just keeps coming in real quick. Looking on diaphragms, there's two major questions that I'm seeing. First one is, what's the average lifespan? And how, you know, how do I know when it, when I should retire it and take a new one out? Mm. That's a, that's a great question. Go ahead, Coach. Yeah. So it's interesting enough. I was digging through my uh, call pouch and found two calls, prototype calls that I had last year. I don't know how well you guys can see it, but this thing is haggard. Um, didn't care for it properly, put it away wet, uh, had it in hot conditions. Um, as long as you can get sound out of it, you'll definitely feel like there's going to be a peak period of it. Generally speaking, through elk season, when I'm bugling a lot, I'm going to go for, go through three or four a season, basically one a week. And that's thousands of bugles um, where, you know, that day in, day out doing the locate. Um, but even as bad as this thing looks, still makes a sound out of it. So if you get a sound out of it, it's good. Um, the big thing is storage. Um, to make it last the longest is get the call dry, put it in the fridge um, in a ventilated container. Um, when you put it away wet is when you're gonna kill the lifespan of that and you'll get some mold, mild, uh, excuse me, mold or mildew, mildew anything like that. So um, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely get a lot of life. I think too, Zach, another question that's coming in quite a bit is like, how do I get better with a diaphragm rate? Or I'm sure a lot of people are thinking it right now. I can't blow a diaphragm rate, right? That's just, I can't do it. And I always, honestly, for a longest time, I thought I couldn't blow a diaphragm rate. I choked on it. I couldn't get any sound out of it. I couldn't get a, a proper seal to the top of my the, um, the top of my mouth and all those things. And what I've learned is in spades, it's just like anything else. It's just like shooting your bow every day to get ready for season. You have to practice with it. You have to like, just take the time and put the time in and practice and practice and you will get the sounds after a while and then just kind of work on those sounds and build on those sounds. We move on to the next slide there, Zach. Jump into the next one. All right, what are we doing now? We're locating, we're locating bulls. So guys, this is kind of our, the cat road shuffle. And I don't know how this, when it all took place as far as saying this is what it is, but it was kind of a Roosevelt thing because there's a ton of cat roads around where we live. And so we called it the cat road shuffle because all we would do is hike and bugle all day long, pretty much until we got that biter. So we're gonna go through these slides a little bit quicker. We could dive in and spend hours on pretty much each one, but we're gonna try to leave enough time to uh, do a lot of question and answer. So we're just gonna kind of cover these and what we don't cover, maybe if you do have a question, throw it down there and we'll try to get to it definitely. So, but uh, calling lower tones, Cody mentioned that already, they go further. So it's like a train whistle. Train whistles carry a long ways. That's why they're that low tone. And um, so we've learned that in just the, the last couple of years that we've started doing rather than the regular, you know, the do, 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 you know, calls. So, um, and then obviously cat road shuffle, we are just putting on miles, whether it be, you know, road bugling at night, whether it be whatever we have to do to find those biters. And we're going to call them, you know, we're looking for a, a one, an elk that wants to play our game. And so that's just the big thing that, that we do different, I think, than a lot of people, as far as we may go past numerous elk, we don't know, to get that one that wants to play the game that we are playing. So there's totally, there's a ton of different ways. Spot and stock's a great way. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to hunt elk and this is just kind of our way. So. Yeah. And then on, on the terrain side of it, it's where Onyx comes in. Honestly, we're always looking when we're calling, dissecting the terrain to understand where our sounds traveling. Maybe if you're in heavy timber, but you're on a ridge top, you may not be able to see exactly that there's a basin down there from in the timber, pulling out the map, paying attention to the topography, 
looking for all those nooks and crannies, those little fingers, the little benches where those elk will spend their time bedded down midday. Um, and that kind of goes into the, the midday scenario. We will hunt all day, we'll call all day, um, working into those bedding areas to try to get those bulls to respond. So if it's 10 o'clock, don't just head back to camp and wait till six o'clock to start the, start the day over. Um, look for those bedding areas to work your way in on them, so. One thing I'll add is, you know, north facing slopes. That's, that's one thing we key on, especially midday. And then like, when it comes to the pace of locating bulls, um, like trying to spot on in the morning, we might cover a ton of ground that we might come back through later on and actually spend some more time trying to get a bull excited. But when we're trying to, to cruise through an area and find one that wants to bugle, we're not going to get too hung up, you know, spending a half an hour building a, a, a sequence of calling to try and get a bull to fire off. Or we might spend some more time in those, what we would consider to be bedding areas midday and trying to get a bull to fire off and try to start with cow calling and then just get more and more excited and kind of escalate that situation until finally a bull, um, you know, he's been listening to it for 20, 30 minutes in his bed and all of a sudden he'll, he'll answer. Yep. So on to the next one, Zach, um, you get a response, now what? Oh. Well, the big thing there um, is celebrate, man. You, you guys worked hard to get in there, find a bull. Like, that's an accomplishment to have an interaction with an elk. Um, first thing after that is pull out Onyx and pinpoint exactly where you think that bugle is. And if you didn't get a good pinpoint, give it some time, try to get that bull to sound off again so you can really dissect exactly where he is and that's going to play your approach whether now you're going to play with the wind what time of day is it what are the thermals doing um is he up feeding is he bedded you can kind of then start to dissect how the approach goes um so the the one thing we, i've seen questions here on heavily hunting areas high pressure does that change the way you call a bull it definitely can um, like I said, we're, we're looking for that aggressive bull. So um, if you have time, map it out, make a good approach and slowly work your way in on that bull. If, if, there's, if you hear another hunter and you're in that competition, uh, just be mindful of that other person. Maybe he was working that bull and you take the bow out and go on to the next one. Um, as far as taking the bull's temperature, is he bugling on his own? Is he sounding off where you don't have to call? If you, do you hear cows? Is he bedded or moving is another one. Um, what we typically try to do is calling bulls is not when they're up and moving. Um, it could be very, a lot of guys will say, oh, he just took his cows and pushed them out of there. Chances are in the morning, if they're doing that, they're not pushing their cows away. They're just going to a place to bed. So stay with them, let them get bedded. And if you have that time, because a lot of times that those thermals are going to change between 9 and 11, sometimes earlier, sometimes later, just depending on the terrain, um, calculate what the wind is going to be doing, where he's going to be bedded, and how you're approaching that. Um, and then uh, if he's fired up, if he's raking, that's where things can get escalated real quick. On to the next one there, Zach. Okay. We're going to make a plan. What is the wind doing? Guys, if there's anything that you get out of this whole thing, it's check the wind. Have a, I mean, we go through a ton of wind checkers. Uh, smoke in the bottle is the one that we use probably the most, I would say, just because it's super simple and it really, really condenses. I mean, it's a good little puff of smoke that you can get a great idea on that. Um, uh, just the big thing that we'll do is we will try to get the, like, like Cody said, pinpoint him we want to put a mark. We want to put an X on X, X right exactly where he's standing. And so we'll all stand in different actual angles when we bugle the next time and just to see, and we all want to get like an 80% pointing rate of we, he's this way. We feel like he's right there. So that's a, that's a big thing and is pinpointing him and, uh, and doing that as far as that goes. So distance from the now can what the wind is doing to your location. And we all know the people that have hunted for a little while, as far as the wind, sometimes, most of the time changes somewhere from around that 1030 hour in the middle of the morning. And so take that into consideration 
Is he bugling right off the bat? Where is he headed for one? And what's the win going to be when I can actually intercept him? So always what I, what I tell people is all day long, doesn't matter if you're on elk or not on elk, in different parts of the hillside, just use your wind checker all the time just to kind of get an idea when you go back into that and, and you'll be like, oh, well, I've already been on that hillside this year and the wind was doing this with the conditions of the weather like this. So I mean, as far as, as far as that goes, use that wind checker as much as you can um definitely so cody already talked about as far as the bull's attitude and um you know if there's a lot of times if he's really really bugling keep in communication with him keep keep in distance of him to where you're you're hiking but yet you he feels safe to bugle back at you and they're headed somewhere like cody was saying it's they're going to a spot the cows are going to make the call at that point so they are headed to a spot that they want to bed for the day just stay behind them and keep them vocal every once in a while, just so you can kind of keep tabs on them and keep following them until they stop. And then that's when you're going to make your stand on them. And then it might be they stop and you have to go clear around the mountain to get a good wind on them. That's what you have to do. You have to do that. And the last but not least is trust your gut. I think a lot of people out there, they are so afraid that they're going to screw it up because I've screwed it up so many times before that they don't do anything. And I, I, I think that's a huge takeaway as far as like, be, be very, you know, trust your gut and, you know, be optimistic, be like, I'm going to shoot that elk right there. I'm going to find that bull and I'm going to shoot that bull, not or cow or whatever it may be. I, I you know, it doesn't matter as far as that goes, but be optimistic, tell yourself, I'm going to do this. And, and, you don't want to set yourself up for failure in that in that realm. So next slide, one question, Zach. One question that's coming in on this one is, you know, let's say you make your plan and as you're saying, like trust your gut and go actually make a move and don't be scared of failing. One question that keeps coming up is what distance should they try to get to to start setting up? Like when are they in the red zone? What's the red zone? Like what's that yardage you guys are trying to get to? I, I would I'll actually take this one real quick. I, I think the red zone kind of changes depending on where that bull's at or where those, those elk are, but you're going to try and get as close as you can to get a good setup to where, when that bull does show himself, he's within bow range. So um, if it's on the spine of a ridge, you can obviously get a little bit closer, but if he has to cover some ground or get into some thicker country to where you can actually call that bull in, it's, it, it's really, you know, topography dependent, but I'm, I'm going to try and get as close as possible to where once that bull starts coming, he's, he's going to pop around a ridge or come up over a knob and he's within 40 yards in an area that I can get a shot. Yeah, it's like that. The 200 yards is safe bubble. When you get to 100 yards is where you're you're tight. And it and like Eric talked about it, it all depends on if it's thick. If it's thick, get as close as you. I mean, make elk sounds as you move in, and you might not set up until you're 60, 70 yards from that bull, and he's got to come. You know, on some of the coast stuff that we hunt you might only have a shot that's 15 yards. And so you can get away with a lot more in thicker country. Strand, you want to run through? Strand, it? You, you got now, this, brother. Yeah, now, now we're going to start talking about my favorite part, which is the whole setup. And uh, one thing that both Cody and Trent talked about was like, get, get some communication between the, um, the shooter and the caller. So once you guys go in to set up, you know, maybe it's a hand signal or maybe it's a, we use three quick cow calls and that means, Hey, we're, we need to move our setup, but have something set up to where once you are um, making those last few moves, you're not having to make a bunch of, of movement, but when we're moving in to, to set up, we're looking for wind. So I want to get the wind in the most favorable spot I can to where when that bull makes the approach, I'm not going to be, you know, giving a whole bunch of scent. I'm looking at my topography. I'm looking at open versus thick. One thing we've talked about a little bit in the past is like this, this meadow mentality. Um, a lot of people want to get to where it's wide open and we're actually looking for basically the exact opposite. We're looking for the thickest train we can because you want that bull to, to hunt for you. You don't want him to come to a, a hundred yard opening, be able to look across and see there's no elk there and then all of a sudden blow out because he doesn't trust it anymore. So we're trying to find an area to where when that bull shows himself, like I said, he's within bow range and, and we can keep the wind right. Um, there's a lot of things that come into your setup, whether it be how you're going to use vegetation to cover yourself, um, setting up in the sun versus setting up in the shade. We try to never set up in the sun, um, for a few different reasons, but one of them is being, it just, it makes you glow. So you've got the best camouflage or cover in the world, but if you're not in the, in the shadows, um, it's pretty hard to, to, to stay hidden. Um, and then, you know, 
clear your surroundings, make sure you're not breaking a bunch of branches while you're standing there. If you have to move um, myself, I prefer standing over kneeling. I want to be mobile. If I need to make two or three steps there towards the very end to get a shot, I want to be able to do that without, without having to stand up and then make a stable platform. You know, if that means even clearing off, if you're on a, a steep side hill and you need to clear some dirt to where you have, you know, a, a comfortable place to stand, take that extra, you know, 30, 45 seconds to, to clear it out and make it to where you can stand there for a long period of time without, you know, having any pain. Um, and then of course it's, it's the, the great debate pack on versus pack off M myself. I like to keep my pack on because there's times where I might start, you know, calling with that bull and then end up a quarter mile away, just working with that bull the entire time. So I don't want to, have to go back and <laughs> try to find my pack, but um, yeah, I, I keep my pack on all the time. And, and I practice that also when it comes to the, the off season um, uh, shooting, I'll, I'll shoot with my, with my pack on and try to shoot with everything while my, my chest rig on and um, go through the motions to where when it comes time to make that shot, it's not something foreign. It's something you've been practicing for a long, long period of time. So, Eric, one question that came in is setting up behind or in front of cover? And obviously it varies depending where you're at, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I myself, I'd, I'd prefer to have no obstructions directly in front of me. So I'm going to stand in, in front of whatever cover. I want a good solid backdrop. Um, but I don't want to have like a, a bush right in front of me where I can't shoot left or right. Um, it, the, the setups on those things too, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier with the, the killer instinct and trusting your gut over time, you know, you're going to screw up more often than not. And so you start to develop a better, a better gut instinct or better killer instinct because you're like, okay, I've done this now 15 times and 14 of the times it didn't work out. I'm going to try and replicate that one time it did. And you'll just start kind of checking those boxes. But yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I would always try to be be in front of my, my cover. Yeah, that that definitely goes into that duck and cover mentality. A lot of people want to like be so hidden that they don't have the opportunity to shoot the bull when it comes in. So it, it's amazing how many times, I mean, to, to get a shot, you're making four or five steps, or you know, you might even make 15 steps just to get around a spot where okay, now when he comes through this window, I can shoot. Cody, let it rip here, buddy. So uh, big thing on calling a bull into range is, is playing on that emotion. It's, we, we talk about it's a lot of times it's a dance. You know, you may get a bull fired up out of his bed. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. He gives you one bedded bugle. You get a pinpoint on Onyx. You slip down in there. You can't just come in there like a wrecking ball and start challenge bugle screaming from the top of your lungs. You have to somewhat, you know, you. you elk or bull elk in in the rut they're there to either fight or breathe so you have to find out what what are those things that are triggering him and stick to it so if that bull's answering a cow call don't all of a sudden just rip a challenge bugle in his face if he's on his way coming in just go with what works and what got you there if he's only responded to the bugle or only responded to the chuckle play on that um copycat techniques one where if it's like that bull's just screaming and he's not chuckling, maybe don't introduce the chuckle. Just keep that same mentality. Um, we, we talk about a lot of times, it's like, if you were in a bar fight, how would you start a bar fight, right? You would start uh, yelling a little bit louder. You're, you're, everything changes as that uh, emotion gets higher. Um, so if he bugles and he's coming in, but he's hung up, cut him off, bugle over the top of him. Um, and you get that anger response. If he's coming in quiet, you hear he's maybe bugled one time and he's responded to those cow calls, lay, keep it laid down low, let that curiosity call that bull in. Um, that's, and then the last thing, the big thing uh, we talked, we haven't talked here, but raking is, is another realism that the setup, especially if you've got a caller behind you that raking, a lot of times those bulls aren't gonna be screaming the whole time, but you'll hear them raking, raking, raking. It just, it's like they're getting ready to do that fight. And then when it's all said and done, if that bull's coming, shut up, let it hit, let that curiosity get him. So if you've got a good setup and he's got to come up over this ridge, you can hear him just on the other side. Don't just keep calling at him to hear him bugle, but get him fired up, shut up. And a lot of times he'll come in silent over that last little bit. So you got to let that curiosity get him killed. I saw, I saw two really good questions there. I'd like to answer real, real quick. We got time. One of them's, you know, what about stepping on a bull or cutting one off? Um, and that just comes into like, if, if you can tell he's getting fired up and he's getting upset, 
yeah, absolutely. Step right on top of them and just keep keep uh, feeding off that emotion to, to keep that um, that anger and you know, building. So yeah, absolutely, we'll cut them off. Um, that's that's a great technique. The other one is like how how do you know if they're coming into fight or breed? Um, and that comes down to like what are they responding to? Because if, if they're coming if they're, if, if they're responding to a lot of bugling and they didn't really respond much to the cow call, they're more or less um, bugling to that, that threat. So they're they're coming back to you like hey stay out of here. I have my cows. I don't want you in here and you know, stay away. And if they're responding to a cow call, um, it always comes back to Steve's bull. But Steve's bull last year, we called in almost entirely with cow calling. That bull left his other cows and actually came up the hill um, to, to, to check out what was going on. All we were doing was making it sound like a bunch of cows and calves are up there walking through the woods. Um, but obviously he was responding better to that, that cow call and would actually almost shut up when we do at him. So he wanted to kind of slip in there and uh, find some more cows. On to the next one there. When to draw your bow. This is awesome. Um, yeah. Always, it's gonna be always and early. Always and early or early and always. However, that comes first. Yeah. Uh, if you're questioning when to draw your bow, draw it. How about that? It's a, uh, I would always rather be drawn with the bull at, at, a, at a safe distance that maybe I, I feel safe that he won't see me rather than him coming to 20 yards and him, then I have to, I have to show my hand, right. And draw right in front of him, however that may be. So practice with that too. Practice uh, while you're shooting. Yeah. See how long you can hold your bow. Um, you know, I think Cody held his bow last year for over two minutes to shoot that big bull that he had last year. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that uh, all this can be done in practice and uh, the, the mouth reads a big thing to just have a mouth read always in your mouth, always. And I don't care if you can't get a great call out of it, have it in your mouth for the, just even if you throw out some God awful scream, yelp, whatever it may be, it's going to be that you need it so it doesn't matter what the what it, what it sounds like necessarily so we just did uh we're doing elk week this week guys and anyway we have a whole section on shot selection if you uh want to go to born and raised outdoors on our youtube channel check this out but um as far as shot selection um man Practice that in your mind first. Get comfortable with the shot that you're going to take. Like uh, if you'll see us, there's a lot of times that we will shoot a frontal shot and it's because we've done it before and we've had great success with it, but there's angles on a frontal that you cannot take, that you cannot, uh, we call it getting cocky with it. Like we won't shoot a frontal if it's like over 25 yards, it better be close because those elk are so quick and they can whirl so fast. And um, so, I mean, I, I think there's, there's things that we talked about before, you know, have that killer instinct, like be confident in certain shot angles, be confident in, in, in where you're going to place that arrow. It's going into that kill mode mentality of, I am going to make this shot no matter what, and I'm going to put the arrow where I need it to go. And then the backside of that is don't rush it to where it's just like, there's an elk. I can, I'm going to kill it and shoot at it. Make sure you really pick a spot and you go through that whole sequence. And then um, following up at the calling after the shot, super important. It'll kind of get their heart rate down. Sometimes it'll kind of, you know, maybe trick them just a little bit into thinking, well, maybe that was an elk. Um, so hopefully they don't run as far. They don't have that adrenaline pumping, you know, to where it may be a hard find if it's a marginal hit. So doing all those little steps can really, really help in the long run. Steve's, Steve's bull came all the way back in and Steve got a shot. And then Cody's bull stopped for a second shot all because of calling after the shot. Yeah. Yeah. One quick question I saw here from Jennifer uh, asking about, does the shooting the bull technique apply to a longbow? Um, that's where you, with a recurve or a stick bow, you got to draw at that shot unless you're south cox and you can hold your bow at a bull bugling at six yards, uh, walking the whole way in. So definitely it's still the same deal though. Um, I shot a bull with a stick bow a few years ago, um, frontal at six yards. So it's, it's definitely lethal on that. Know your anatomy is the big thing. And when you do, if you haven't killed a bull, but your hunt partner has, and you guys have a bull on the ground, go, take the time to go through and understand what bones are where, how that correlates to the hide. Um, knowing that that's the biggest thing is really knowing that if you've never killed an elk before 
and you got a bull stand there at 20 yards, frontal's probably not the shot you want to take. You, you don't know where to aim, how to you know, go through it. Get some experience in uh, is, is the one thing I would ask. Oh, yeah, baby. We just shot an elk. We just shot an elk. Cody, go ahead. So uh, this is the highlight, right? This is the roller coaster of bow hunting. You think you double lunged him. You think you heard him go down. How long do you wait? We, we, we used to be oh, 20, 30 minutes. Now, it, no matter what, it's an hour. Um, elk are big animals. They got bones. You can get a deflection, an arrow. Unless you physically see that bull go down, watch him expire, um, give it at minimum an hour. Uh, first thing you're going to do is you're going to check that arrow. Look for the arrow. Find sign. Is that nice, bright, bubbly arrow? Bubbles on the arrow covered in blood, lung blood? Chances are he's not going to be too far. Is it dark blood? Is it, is it liver? Is it, does it have gut on the arrow? These are all the clues. It, you're putting this investigation together to try to figure this out. Um, so... Is it daylight? Is it dark? Is the weather, is it going to be raining? That's all going to dictate how and how fast or how slow you're going to go about it. If it's a gut shot elk, minimum six hours. If you know that you hit that, that elk, it's going to die, but it's not going to go very far. If you push in in the first hour, he's going to be alive. He's going to jump up, take off, and you're going to not have any, any sign as to where that bull's going. Uh, you're going to have minimal blood, if any at all. Um, so really kind of put those puzzles together. The very first thing after you find that arrow, mark a waypoint and then turn your tracking mode on on Onyx. That is key for us because a lot of times when we've gone on these blood trails, um, finding that, you know, you get it 250 yards, you're in on a blood trail, all of a sudden you lose blood. And you're like, man, where is he going? You can pull up that map and you can get a really good general line if you need to start gridding. So get that uh, travel path figured out um, and just slow and steady, take your time. Um, if you've got multiple people thing, you know, a lot of people can ruin those clues. They're wanting to get out in front. They're excited. Take the time to find the blood, have someone stay at the last blood, one person on the point to lead forward, looking for blood again. Um, just take your time, be methodical about it. Meat care, gutless method. That's a, a game changer. Um, we've done a lot of videos on it. Um, where you basically, you, you can take, just skin it, take all the parts off. You're going to take the quarters, the back strap, rib meat, tenderloins, neck meat, all that in one, pull that elk over, take care of the second half. It's, uh, it's a very good, clean way to take care of meat. The biggest thing is like you spend all this time, money, tags, gas, food. The last thing you want to do is ruin the meat. Um, so take your time going through that and have good meat bags uh, take care of what, what you're investing in all this for the groceries, for the family, for the year. And the pack out, it's my favorite part. Sometimes it sucks, but it's like one of those enjoyable, uh, the harder, the better kind of deals. A lot of times we'll take those ones close to the truck too, but those, uh, you know, I mean, you work so hard about it, enjoy the whole time while you're going out. Sweet. So just quick housekeeping. Definitely keep the questions coming. Keep an eye out. We're going to be doing a giveaway. There will also be a promo code coming through to Born and Raised Call Co. Um, through in your email that you'll receive. And then this will also, there's been a lot of questions on, can I watch this after? Can I download this? We'll send all these resources and definitely tune into Born and Raised's YouTube channel. They have their Elk Week going on. So there's going to be a ton of content. I believe you guys are doing what? One a day at 4 p.m. So videos all week going out. So definitely tune in there. We have a ton of questions. So I'm just going to start going through them and we'll try to get through as many as we can. The one thing that I, I saw this last night in our calling video, the one question I keep seeing here, solo, solo hunting strategy, calling strategy. I want to touch on that because I think that's, you know, we've been blessed to have great hunting partners. We've got guys that all can blow a call, but I think this is one um, for someone maybe new to the sport or just enjoys that solitude. Um, a lot of these can tactics can still be the same where it's, it's a big breakdown at the very last minute or the last part of this calling sequence is the setup is very critical here. You have to be in a spot where 
the big thing of if a bull hears a sound and he can see where that sound's coming from, that's the distance he's going to stop. So whether that terrain is 80 yards from where he's calling, he's going to come to 80 yards, stop, and he's he's going to use his eyes as the the buffer there. So you have to get in a spot where you can get that buffer where it's going to be inside range. He's going to break over that ridge and he's got to look in order to see where you're at. You get get close. Um, the other two is volume. When you're calling, that last little bit, uh, one trick that you can do when you're going to bugle, turn and bugle slowly, or bugle quieter down. You can muffle the back, muffle the tube to get that real quiet bugle. You don't want to scream at him because he can, he'll think, you know, he's closer than what he is and he's going to stop. So use the terrain um, and always in your head, um, think about where is he going to see from where I'm calling. And then two, use the curiosity factor, stop calling and then sneak up, move that 30 to 40 yards to where you can get. And he's going to draw over the ridge at that point. The critical point in that is be quiet. Don't be breaking sticks. You're, you're, you're trying to sneak at that point into that next shooting spot. So. Two, the perfect. Go, Go ahead. ahead. No. Um, we're dancing here, aren't we, Strand? This is nice. Uh, no, uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, decoys, too. And it's something you'll probably see. You've probably maybe seen a lot of them on our packs a lot, and we hardly ever use them. But I think they can be actually very, very effective, especially for a uh, possible solo hunter, you know, in that scenario, too. Like, set that decoy back up. If you have a good setup, give his visual something to look at. And it goes to the stick bow hunter, too. Something that where – and you can have time, a chance to draw your bow possibly possibly as well so i was just going to add what cody was saying as far as the the, the solo hunting because it is we hear about it all the time one thing you just don't want to get in the habit of doing is you want to call move and then do not call because the next time you make a sound you've effectively just changed your caller shooter setup by having the caller behind you and if, if everyone wants to do it they want to hear that little bugle they want to hear him make a sound so when they see him they call well the gigs up and if he's at 80 yards your, your chances of him coming within bow range are basically out the window. So it, it, it's hard because <laughs> we all want to hear him bugle, but uh, being sneaky and remembering that wherever you, wherever you call from last, that, you're basically placing the cow or the bull at that spot. And between you and the bull now is that gray area that, that, that you can shoot from. Now that we covered some solo, there's a lot of questions on when you have partners. What's the distance from the shooter to the caller? What do you guys try to target there? So that's going to change a lot. So we have this uh, scenario where we want the caller to actually be able to have a visual with the shooter. And the reason we do that, and it may be, you know, in Roosevelt country, we may be over his shoulder. We may be 10 yards behind the shooter. It's, it totally depends on the scenario. And it goes with taking the temperature of that bull. How mad is he? What does he want to do? What's he coming in for? Is he coming into fight or is he coming in for curiosity? What's, what's going on there? And then also is where is he coming at? So the shooter's in the middle, obviously. That caller is constantly moving back and forth and trying to get that bull to come straight across that shooting lane for that shooter. So we start out usually somewhere around 50 yards, probably somewhere in there. And then like Strand was saying before, we're always mobile. We keep really, really mobile. So at those three cow calls, those three quick cow calls, that tells that caller, hey, I'm going to move. And so, okay, so the caller's going to try to get in a spot where he can see the shooter better to where he's going to move. And then based on what he's doing out in front of him is where that, where that caller is going to move to. Another thing we do is we have hand signals. Strand mentioned on this just a little bit as far as like you'll see us, we wave our hand over our head. And that means go ahead and try to do more cow calling or we put our thumb by our mouth. And that means try to do more bugling. So all of those things, breaking, right? Yes. And that's another great thing too. If you can see the bull, cause usually the shooter can see the bull, the caller can't. And so he's telling him what he needs to do. And so it's every time that caller calls and that bull rakes a tree, that shooter is going to re lean back and say, Hey, start raking. You know, start doing that. Communicate as much as possible in a multi-caller um, shooter setup. 
have that other shooter say we have two shooters, right? Have him get on the downwind side. So if that bull tries to flank you and tries to come in downwind, that extra guy can shoot it. So, I mean, there's ton of techniques when it comes to uh, multiple people and collar shooter scenarios, but kind of play around with it and, uh, and come up with your own handling or your own sign language and, uh, and just have fun with it. man. Yeah. And the, the other thing to touch on that too is, Generally, when we enter a setup, it's not like a fixed position. I'm going to call from right here and Trent's going to stay right there and we're going to wait till this thing happens. It's, it's constantly kind of moving micro adjustment as the bull moves. We, the caller, if, depending on what the wind's doing, you always want to get that uh, more on the upwind side, that caller. So it's going to try to come into that location. So shooter's going to be on the downwind side of where the caller's calling from. So as that bull goes to circle in, he can get that shot, kind of brings it that arc by him. Um, and two, if, if all of a sudden the bull's direction changes, don't just call from the same spot. If you need to move to draw based on what he's doing and how the wind's going, then make the adjustment that way. Um, the, the, the caller really is the one that's in the driver's seat of this whole situation. So, so the next question is, do you guys change your, your tactics or strategies based on thicker country versus more open country? Yeah, I would, I would say we bugle more in thick country because our sound's not going to travel as far. And we're actually, we might be a little more cognizant of like bugling into every little nook and cranny. Um, it's really interesting. If you ever have, if everyone has time, spare yourself out about 150 yards, 200 yards. It's amazing what we think is a loud bugle at 150 yards, especially around even the most slight bend in the road or on a ridge. You can't even hear it. So if, if you're in an area that's real thick, we're going to bugle a lot more, and we're going to be a little more diligent about covering every little square inch. Whereas in open country, we're going to really focus on being on top of a ridge where we can broadcast that sound down into each, each canyon and, and cover it that way. As far as, like, differences, like, and it, we get asked too a lot. What about Roosevelt's versus Rockies? We do the same, same thing, same game. So the next question, sticking on bugling, someone asks, "Is that can you bugle too much?" Zach, you should answer this question. You've gone over this. So these guys, I will attest. These guys, like the cat road shuffle and everything, and talking about like if an elk's not playing the game. I remember specifically six years ago, we actually spotted some elk who were not into they weren't being you know they weren't running they didn't care what we were doing and we actually moved on and went and got on a different bowl these guys will cover ground and they will bugle until we find one that's fired up and then they are super smart i there's a couple of points that i want to just throw in here one thing cody touched on it briefly mimicking the elk as soon as we locate one we will get in tight and these guys do such a good job switching it up and figuring out what's going to evoke emotion from them and so Definitely, like, they're calling frequently, looking for a bull that's going to get fired up or respond. And once they respond, they're moving in aggressively, and they're going to find a way to get them to come in. So they do a very good job of just kind of understanding the situation. But it all starts with covering country and trying to locate. And on that note, there are a lot of questions on the locating side. Cody, what's one thing you do to locate, you know, maybe even before you bugle? Um, so the big thing is just dissecting the terrain and making it as efficient movements as possible. I think that like going into a game plan versus just like, oh, I'm going to take off from here and you don't realize what, what kind of terrain you're diving into. Um, so really like looking at the map, try to like when Zach and, uh, from THP and Zach Sando, we went to Colorado and we were backpack hunting. Like every night we were kind of like trying to end the day to start the next day and plan like how we're going to hunt, how we're going to break down the mountain. Um, so, so really the, the terrain is going to dictate your movements, be as efficient as possible. And then when we're locate calling, I, I saw a question pop up, like how long do you wait? Depends on what day of the season at this point. If we've heard, of, you know, like we're, we're definitely more patient in the early part of the season as, as per time goes on. Seems like if the bull is going to respond, we're calling a lot. He's going to respond quickly. Um, we, we're not ones where we're going to just post up for 45 minutes and call and call and call. We're going to bugle. We're going to move 200 yards, bugle again. Um, a lot of times we'll, we will go through a gamut of sounds. We'll start with a cow call. 
you, you kind of like have that buffer, right? You know, that bull might be bedded and he's only 100 yards away. The last thing you want to do is rip up there on a bugle and scare him. I've been there, I've done that. Um, it's not a fun feeling. But start with the cow call, go into a bedded bugle where it's just a ooh, super quiet, small, then progress all the way through and take notes as when the bull cracks off, a lot of times maybe he, he finally responded to a chuckle and the next time just chuckle at him. Um, you know, it's kind of always mentally taking notes as you're going through that. Perfect, Jump into the next one. So there's a lot of questions actually about calling, or calling cows in. What's your guys' strategies there? I like yeah. using a calf call. Go yeah, that's, that's great. No, no, that's great, Strand. As far as uh, calf call, um, we've even called cows in bugling. You know, it, it's never like to be um, to be totally honest. We we've we've tried to call cows in before, but usually we're trying to call a bull. Usually we we are, and it's um, there's nothing wrong with trying to call cow calls in or cows in. That's for darn sure. So maybe that calf sounds, maybe just sounding like a herd. There's been times that we broke brush and had cows come in just because they're curious, you know, just because they're looking for friends or looking for, you know, other, other elk. So just a bunch of different, um, uh, calls would work. And as far as like, uh, decoys too, that might, you know, get one to walk over and, and curiosity and that nature too. But, um, usually we're calling bulls in, but, um, yeah, you never know exactly what's going to go in. And that kind of prefaces the question of, well, do you sound small to kill a, you know, small bull? And do you sound big to try to kill a big bull? We try to sound the same. We just try to sound as big as we can on every single time that, that we're calling. We found that uh, the smaller bulls will come in and look and just for curiosity and, um, and the bigger bulls will come in to maybe fight or whatever that may be. So anyway, we usually don't variate too much our bugles. Yeah, and one thing I will say that I've learned from these guys throughout the years is there are times to be silent and sneaky, but these guys are actually, they do a really good job of when we're moving through and maybe we've located some or whatever, they actually like, you You want to sound like elk, you know? And so if you're breaking some sticks, they're cow calling. And we've actually, I know in Colorado, we have those cows that pop up at like eight yards right in front of us. Yep. And at that point, we we're actually trying to work on a bull ended up trying to sound like group elk because there was what five of us so it's very difficult to be sneaky and so we're breaking sticks cow calling whatnot and we actually had a group elk move in right on top of us well and actually yeah elk when they're relaxed make a ton of noise oh man elk, when they're on edge are super sneaky so if you are super sneaky moving in they're like what is going on here but if you just sound like a bunch of elk moving through the woods especially if you're trying to sound like a bull who's fired up the bull that's fired up is not going to be dainty and be poking around. He's he's coming in like a wrecking ball. So I want to add on one thing that Trent said about calling in big bulls and small bulls. I've heard that a lot. Well, I want to sound like a weaker bull because I, I want a bigger bull to come in. A big a big bull who has cows, he want he's he's not going to come and mess with a little five point. He, he's messed with them for the whole season. He's not going to break away from his cows. Come check that out. And then the other thing is the, the loudest guy out there, the best bugler with the most volume, is still. Sound like a like a wimpy bull. <laughs> we just we we don't have the lung capacity that 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 a bull elk does, and so blow as hard as you can, as loud as you can, and just try to sound like an elk. Awesome. Next question is uh, tactics for midday, and just your guys' opinion on hunting during midday. And I know we covered it a little earlier, but I know this is something you guys do a ton of. So can you give them? Yeah, after, after nine a.m., just go back to camp. That's what I do. It depends on what kind of. Depends on who's buying the beer and who's bringing the beer. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is a huge, uh, huge takeaway as far as we've killed, I would say 90% of our elk between the hours of probably 10 a.m. and 2 to 3 p.m right? That mid middle of the day. And that, and that it's, you know, and we always talk about wait till they're bedded and then you can go in and bugle them and get the wind right. You have time to actually move, move the chest pieces around to where it's all in your favor and to where you're only going one-on-one -on -one with that elk, right? 
because there's a ton in the herd sometimes there you know there could be 10 to 15 animals well that's 10 to 15 noses that's uh carry the two for the eyes anyway a lot of eyes and that's a whole bunch of different smell that you're gonna actually waft down on that herd but if you can pull that bull out of that herd then it's one-on-one -on -one and it really puts the uh, odds in your favor better so that's why we do it in the middle of the day because cows they're comfortable. They, they will stay usually. Sometimes you can push in early morning and the cows will take off. Well, he's just going to follow him. He's not going to come running back to you and, and come fight you generally. So anyway, that's why we do the middle of the day. I, the only thing I'll, I'll add, unless you want to add something, Cody, um, is I'm, I'm going to hunt a little bit differently. I'm going to be a little more methodical, use Onyx to try and find those areas that are north facing slopes with small micro benches three quarters of the way out. I'm, I'm going I'm to more or less try to like pinpoint where I want to call. And then depending on the time of season, if it's, if it's been a rowdy morning and there's bulls bugling all over the place, yeah, you're more apt to get a, a pretty quick response. But there's a lot of times we'll sit on the landing or sit on a spot um, for 15, 20 minutes and kind of start soft and then just build until finally all of a sudden you get this little bedded bugle you know, response or a chuckle halfway down the, the ridge. All of a sudden those elk, it's like, okay, they're there. They're not fired up, but not, now we have something to play with. Yeah, the only thing you know, I'll add to, um, on that midday, a lot of why we're up early is locate. Like we're using those pre-dawn or, or daylight hours to locate. And then from there, it's like we're trying to kill them in that midday um, and then use the morning as, uh, like I said, location. We, we had a case in New Mexico a couple of years ago. We couldn't find any help from daylight during the daylight hours the only way we found elk was road bugling at night or at like three in the morning on we'd get up at two drive cover a bunch of country they were not by bed to, by daylight they were bedded down they were quiet um so that's why we use those times and then once we find them we might take a nap get caught up on sleep and then go in there and kill them you know at noon so um next one is for novice hunters what you know what are the one to two most important calls that they should work on first that's a great that's a great question uh always uh, diaphragm read learn it it's the easiest one because you can make the most variant amount of calls with it you can make a cow calf you can make it bull you can bark you can chuckle you can do everything so and the other answer to that would be our calls would be what you would want to go with okay for and race <laughs> you see what i did there you see what i did there yeah i love it i love it yeah definitely check them out on that note what is your guys's favorite diaphragms obviously you love them all but i know you guys <laughs> use different ones there's questions about which ones specifically you guys prefer this is the big ass big ass question put that away put that away this is the big ass question you know as far as which one's going to work for me? Everybody's palate's so different. Everybody is so different as far as what they can blow. Um, my favorite's going to be the committed read. I do like the easy cow that we just came out with. That is one of my uh, second favorites, I would say. Cody's going to say the reason. He's going to say September, uh, probably. He's shaking his head. Maybe he's got new ones now. Yeah. Um, I actually, the easy cow, so we, we designed this as a cow call, and I love bugling on it. Like, yeah, I absolutely love it. So, so Strand's probably going to run with uh, Land of the Free or OTC or one of the other ones. So, I like the September and the Elf and Land of Free. It, it really it comes down to personal preference on like latex thickness and stretch. And that's why we have so right now we have seven calls and we're always playing around with different stretches and different you know thicknesses. But like, I, I like a heavier read with a lighter stretch. Some people like a really light read with a heavy stretch or, or no stretch. It's, you, you have to you have to try a few out and then you'll find the one like i'll literally have probably a half dozen of these in my in my pack with me and then a half dozen of the easy cows and call are good so yeah yeah and i would say definitely once you find one these guys touched on it buy a bunch of them yeah. if you find one you like make sure you have plenty of them yeah. trevor thanks for joining whoa from the whoa. cheap seats I was like who's this <laughs> joining in oh man um next question we have so this one's going to be more on just lost it looking for it here um oh still on the novice topic 
What are some common mistakes that you see, you know, when people are first start out calling? Okay, I'll go first. My, mine's going to be going back to the same place year after year because they had a good, good encounter four years ago in, on this one spot, and there was always out there. I, I just I, I only bring that up because I hear it all the time. Like, yeah, man, we, we've been on the same place for eight years, and we've killed two bulls so far. I'm like, that's great. I'm dope for you. But where there's elk last year, it might not be elk this year, depending on fires and how dry it is, how much moisture there is. Um, predators, poaching, a lot of a lot of factors. We we honestly don't hunt the same places very often at all. Like for the most part, we're bouncing around and just trying to find where the, the biggest concentration is. But that that's one. Yeah, and then I think the other uh, point to that, kind of adding on it, is people have an expectation of what it should or shouldn't be, and they're the first few days they may make their decision of like, oh, this is terrible. The season's terrible. I haven't seen or heard a bull. Um, have a whole list of plans of backup A through Z on where you can go. Um, don't be afraid to move. We've made some drives in Colorado over the counter, literally drove 12 hours across the state and hunted a different unit the next day through the night. Um, so don't be afraid to make a big move. Um, but have as many options in your back pocket as possible. There may be a, a ton of hunting pressure at a trailhead that year that you didn't see in years previous. Go uh, check out a new area. So, I got one more. Sorry, Trent. I'm gonna Go, ahead. Have... Go ahead. Don't don't leave bugles to find bugles. Like I, I get it all the time. If you got bulls bugling or you know where a bunch of bulls live in, they have cows. There's a cow in heat. Hunt them until you've bumped them out of the country. I mean, just stay with them. It, yeah, to, to add on that. Uh, I would say strike while the iron's hot. So um, there's a lot of times where we've hunted in the evenings after work. We get there with only one hour to hunt, and you find a biter, and you can you can get a bowl in the right kind of mood. It, it can only take minutes to get it done. So just don't be afraid to, to dive in. Don't be too tentative. Yeah, I would say the same thing as far as I was going to key off of just go, just do it. You know, I think a lot of people are out there just saying, well, those guys live where elk are. Yeah, we do. But uh, just go make a plan. If you live in Pennsylvania right now and you're sitting here watching this and you're saying, you know, I've always wanted to elk hunt. And I, I just, you know, it's always been a, you know, one of those things that's just out, outside of my reach. You got to make those plans and just go. Life is so short. And with all the things now on X maps, all it can be so safe to go. You can actually see the country before you get there. You can, there's so many things in your favor uh, in this era that we live in. It's like, man, you have no reason not to just go do it. Love it. Um, the next question, this kind of ties in, cause I think this is a time period when I'm not, a lot of people aren't going out, but there's a ton of questions about late season, like post rut tactics mm -hmm. or like call shy elk because of wolves or other factors. What's your guys' strategies there? Pick up a rifle. No. <laughs> the month of October was made for rifle hunting. You're darn right it was, Trent. <laughs> um, so, so, so Trent and I actually hunted um, in Idaho last year on a, on a couple rifle tags. That It was my first experience hunting like truly wolf-pressured elk. We actually missed a wolf on that hunt. There was wolves either in counters or we were in wolf sign every single day. Um, it was tough because those elk were in huge numbers. When we did find them, it was herds of 100 or more. They're super tight and balls that just what were they, they they sensed anything wrong and they were gone so i'm not going to have a whole lot of experience as far as calling at those elk um but we covered we covered a ton of country i mean literally we'd go forever we just would not stop until we found them but that's the best best tactic i can give you is just cover a ton of ground and try to find them i think there's and tough if, I, if, go ahead if there's predators if there's predators there, then you know that there's there's elk there, there's prey there, right? So probably in a good spot. Perfect. We'll do just a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up here. A um, couple questions on gear, broadhead choice. What's your guys' take on that? <laughs> that is the most question we get, honestly. It's probably right <laughs> up there. And the, the, the answer is we all use something different. I shot uh, Strickland, I believe, last time I bow hunted. I'll probably be shooting Exodus this year. Cody's shooting a Voodoo 9000 or whatever it's called. 
Coyote what is it? Australian. Okay. Australian. Yeah. Iron Will is another one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then right. Kudu. Kudu is a great head. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big, big uh, Kudu fan. Yeah. And last year was the first time I ever hunted with an expandable, and I killed a bull. So I'm going to try that again this year. So we're all up in the map. Yeah, I know there was, there's still, you guys did a video, what was that, last year, kind of breaking down all this different stuff, so definitely go check that one out. A couple of years yeah. ago, we did a full broadhead, like, from replaceable blade to fixed blade to expandable, the whole gambit, um, crazy, it was a huge project, but it was pretty insightful. Um, the biggest thing, accuracy and sharp, like, you got to hit what you're aiming at, and it's got to be sharp, so. Confidence, be confident with your gear. Yes. Yes. They got to spin good. Um, all right. So, you know, the last one is really just what are like your top three, just kind of a lot of folks are asking, like, what's a key takeaway that you want to make sure, like when I'm going to the field, I need to make sure I do this. So when you guys are going out, what are some things that you're always doing that has, you know, ultimately led to success? Bringing toilet paper would be numero uno. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keys to success is what you asked. Um, no, <laughs> uh, just a positive attitude would be mine. Just a positive attitude and go out there with the ability to, to, to tell yourself, I don't know everything because I will guarantee you we've done this for so many years. And this year we will go out and say, man, I just learned something new. You know, it's just, there's so many things to elk hunting and different ways to tracking and blood trailing and all these different things that go into this awesome, awesome thing that we just, you know, just keep a positive attitude and go out there and have fun and be willing to learn something new. Yeah. And then I think on number two, and it's on our last slide is never be afraid of failure. Like if you don't go, you're going to fail. So you go on a trip, you don't get an elk encounter that first trip, but you learned a bunch. You, you went and explored new country, like huge success. And then set those milestone. Know your limits is the other one. Like if, if you've never gone in the Rockies and you don't feel comfortable staying at a car camp by yourself, don't go on a 10 day backpack trip by yourself solo deep in the wilderness, like know your limits. Um, and yeah, you'll have fun. I would, I would say um, if this year is your first ever year that you have a bull and bow range and you get to the chance and you're fortunate enough to come to full draw, remind yourself to take some deep breaths before it comes in, get your body relaxed, get your heart rate down, get your breathing relaxed. And when you pull that bow back and you're settling the pins on it, you have more time than you think to make that shot. So don't rush it. You've waited so hard, you've worked so hard and you've waited for this one opportunity. Take your time in that moment and make it count. I'll add one last one. That is just don't put a lot of pressure on yourself. Enjoy being with your friends, enjoy being in the mountains, being somewhere new, trying something new, a new state, a new adventure. Um, I've been guilty of the, of the past of like, okay, I got six days to kill a bull. I gotta make this happen. And I'll, you're you're sometimes most successful when you're not uh, not putting any pressure on yourself at all and just enjoying it love it well thank you guys i really appreciate it for everyone on thank you for attending keep an eye out there's going to be a giveaway link going out there's also going to be an email with some more resources check out born and raised youtube they got their elk week going on also look back at their other videos there's so much information in there it would take you months years it would take you a long time to get through all of it. And then definitely check out Born and Raised Call Co. And keep an eye out for a promo code in this email. And then we'll also have another campaign going on later on where you'll be able to get a discount on their stuff. Make sure you get your calls. Cody, as Cody said, hunting season is, what, 40 days away. So Crazy. it'll be here before you know it. But thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for tuning on. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thank you, guys, so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Sorry it's late. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, That's going to be my bad. That's going to be my bad.